Uh, yeah, thank you very much for having us here uh, this afternoon. Um, and hopefully, hopefully everyone can get uh, as, as, as enthusiastic as the normal reception uh, for talking about shielings and, and upland archaeology, uh, lumps and bumps, turf, grassy hummocks, the like. Um, so what I'll do, I think, is I'll, I'll kind of go through the, the kind of context of the kind of time period that I'm interested in. That is the kind of early modern period. So roughly from the kind of start of the, six, uh, the, the start of the 17th century through to roughly kind of the, the, the early 19th century. Um, and that kind of transition to sheep farms or hunting estates and forestry, um, as we might know it now. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk through some of the kind of key themes and how this landscape, uh, Glencoe, and particularly this tributary Glen, Glen Lark and are being managed in this period. Um, and think about kind of some of the, 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 the interactions that are being drawn from those as well, and then go on to the kind of work that we're hoping to do um, in future seasons as well. Um, I should say this has all been based off my PhD research, um, which is looking at kind of how people are... Uh, interacting in these upland landscapes across Scotland, so from the, the, the Outer Hebrides across to the kind of Cairngorms and, and, and the area we might kind of term as the Gilta. Um, and thinking about kind of the busyness of these landscapes at various points seasonally, um, so moving away from those kind of narratives of upland emptiness and the kind of the lonely milkmaid at our shillings, la -de da 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 um, and thinking about these as actually quite in, industrial landscapes where things are, people are, are kind of negotiating different power relationships. Um, there's various kind of very industrial activities going on as well. Um, and so there's kind of networks and, and of interactions that are going on here that, that aren't necessarily what we would think of um, in these landscapes. So just to give a brief kind of uh, context then. Um, so there has been work done in this kind of time period in the region of kind of Glencoe before. So particularly Chris Dalgleish has done a lot of work uh, looking at kind of the, the formalization of estate centers um, and, and the kind of network of castles that, that comes about from the kind of late 1500s into the 1600s uh, through the uh, Campbells of Glen Orkey um, and their holdings expanding quite, quite uh, militaristically from Kilkern um, and their, their kind of roots in, in the kind of wider uh, Campbell heartlands of Argyll spreading right the way across until they're the kind of Earls of Bredalban at a certain point. Um, and for this kind of time period, um, we see this, this, this kind of insecurity among the elites in this time period, and these kind of big regional elites have received quite a lot of study, be it Campbell of Argyll or Campbell of Glen Orkey in this area. Um, but we don't actually have very much about the smaller players in this landscape, and that's why Glencoe, and particularly thinking about the kind of McDonald's of Glencoe, is a really quite an interesting example um, of how these landscapes are being kind of uh, managed, how power is being negotiated and, and confirmed within these upland landscapes, which again haven't really received quite as much uh, work in this area. Um, so for much of the uh, 1600s, the McDonald's, McDonald's and Campbell um, of Glen Orkey are actually in a kind of uh, a fairly happy agreement with each other. Um, McDonald of Glencoe signs a treaty of uh, man rent and protection with C Campbell of Argyll um, and essentially does his dirty work in clearing the, the McGregors from various, various areas of kind of Rannoch um, and, and the kind of fringes of, of Campbell lands where they're been, being a nuisance. Um, that kind of changes with the kind of religious wars of the, the latter part of the 1600s. Um, and then we come to the point where, by 1692, uh, Campbell, of, uh, Campbell of Glen Orkey is actually one of the kind of leading instigators of the massacre of the McDonald's in Glencoe, um, which is one of the kind of disruptive events um, in the, the, the history of this period, uh, of this area as well, and what might be quite most iconic about it. Um, so this is the kind of study area that I'm interested in. Uh, this is Glencoe, and this is the kind of the, the, the heart of Glencoe, I guess, uh, with the kind of main settlement sites, uh, Invercoe, Carnach. Uh, Achnacon, Antor, Sroon, and then Achtreichten as well. Um, Achtreichten might be familiar to some. I'm sure Derek and the NTS archaeologists have presented it before, uh, I wouldn't doubt. Um, and there's also been some work done as well at uh, Antor, uh, I think by Scotia Archaeology, and then at Achnacon as well. There was some trial trenching as well. Um, so there has been some study of the kind of settlement archaeology of Glencoe, and often kind of focused on do we see continuation or, or kind of disruption from that, that 1692 massacre. Um, but very little work's actually been done in the kind of uplands of Glencoe, and that's what I'm quite interested in, is how is power being negotiated and how are kind of different networks of, uh, of practices going on within these uplands um, and the kind of seasonalities of those. So we'll go through in a kind of uh, thematic sense. So thinking, first of all, about the kind of woodlands of Glencoe then, and actually the, the kind of iconic pictures and the iconic kind of representation we have of Glencoe as this kind of sheep-grazed, uh, quite, quite kind of Spartan hillside, actually... We know that, from, particularly from the map evidence and from some of those kind of early travellers' accounts, it's a really quite a forested landscape, actually. And we have even as, as, as early as kind of Timothy Pont's uh, records, we have it depicted as uh, kind of forested and with a, 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 the caption, a great, a great forest of furs, uh, 
Um, it's, it's mentioned as a, areas of Glencoe as a royal hunting forest um, from around about the 14th century, um, but that's mostly focused on the other side of the Glen, um, out towards the Rannoch Moor and stretching down to Dalness um, in Glen Etive. Um, and that seems to have kind of been past the rights to that hunting forest, as, as so many of them were, uh, as a kind of boon first to the Stuarts of Appen, um, who are the, the kind of early uh, feudal lords in this area, and then to Campbell of Argyle. And so by the time we get to the 1790s, uh, the rights to all the forests in Glencoe and the harvesting of the timber from them doesn't actually belong to MacDonald of Glencoe at all. He actually has to uh, pay to take the very timbers to build his own ho houses. Um, and in fact, the, the, the Stuarts of Appen and the Campbells of Argyle uh, sign an uh, agreements that the, the, essentially the entire glen is deforested in a rather rapid period uh, by lowland timber com companies. Um, and so we, we see quite an interesting kind of negotiation of the management of these woodlands in Glencoe through this period. Um, so one of the main ways, particularly in the uplands, that that kind of can be evidenced is through these charcoal burning platforms. And there's essentially there's a network of them running up and down this tributary glen that we're looking at, Glen Lach uh, which translates potentially as the, this, the, the glen of the rock of the milk churn. Uh, which might give us a, a slight suggestion that there's some transhumance going on. Um, but we've got these charcoal burning platforms dotted along the, the banks of the burn, um, and from the earlier map evidence, we can see that this was probably quite a forested landscape, and so the shielings and the other kind of features that I'll show you that are within it are sitting within a kind of woodland landscape as well. Um, so that's quite important for thinking about how things are related to each other, how visible things are from each other as well, um, and, and, and for giving a kind of feel of what this landscape might have been like. And so we have quite an intense network of, of, of charcoal burning platforms dotted around the kind of the, the rear part of the glen um, within the kind of main cluster of shielings as well. So we're thinking these are, these are practices with very different seasonalities. You're, you're charcoal burning, you're kind of coppicing your woods probably in the early spring, and then you're doing the charcoal burning itself um, in the autumn when the, the woods had a chance to dry. The shielings, obviously, you're up there for the summer. But there is a kind of using of the same spaces and potentially some interaction going on around that as well, whether it be the, the, the charcoal burners occupying the shielings uh, during their work. Um, or, or, or similar. And this might be related, this being kind of lands associated with Campbell of Glen Orkney and Campbell of Glen uh, of Argyll, it might be related to sites like the Bono Ironworks, which is, which is very close actually um, from, from here, just across Rannoch, or just easily accessible down the coast as well. Sorry, let's see. So thinking that, that MacDonald of Glencoe doesn't actually have the right to harvest the timber even within Glencoe, um, the main fuel, the main domestic fuel in this area, and potentially also for some of the other kind of practices that we see, is, is peat cutting and, and, and the use of peat for, for uh, your fire. Um, and so there's quite an interesting kind of question of where the, the uh, McDonald's of Glencoe are actually getting their peat from. They're obviously fairly close to Rannoch Moor, massive quantities of peat there, uh, but that would require lugging it all the way over the pass of Glencoe, which is quite the feat to, to, to have to drag all the peat you would require uh, to heat your house through the winter uh, from all the way up there. And so we've been trying to kind of identify potential sources within Glencoe proper, within that kind of lower portion of the Glen, um, where people might be accessing their peat. And we've found this really quite convincing network of tracks um, and, and, and kind of uh, passes over the, the kind of upland hill slopes and across the bogs as well. Um, and then a really nice, quite intense uh, area of peat cutting as well, up in the kind of tributary between uh, where Glen Lach goes over into Glen Creeran uh, Forestry Commission land. Forestry land, Scotland land, sorry. Um, and so there's a quite interesting kind of thinking about the, 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 the movement of people and the kind of network of interactions that that produces as well. So it has its own set of seasonalities, the peat cutting. So we've got in the early spring, you're going up and you're cutting your peats, or, or late spring rather. Um, you're stacking them, you're drying them, you're perhaps returning periodically to make sure you've rotated your peats and, and restacked um, so that they're drying all the way through. And then in the late summer, as probably quite a communal activity, you're carrying them back down because this is quite a labour intensive process, quite heavy work. Um, and the tracks to access these do run right the way through all the shielding grounds. And so there's a kind of interaction even there kind of passively of people from the township travelling up through the shielings and on, on up to the, uh, the, the peat cutting banks as well. Um, and people are really kind of interacting in this landscape in ways that, that, that aren't quite the kind of freeing and, limine, uh, and liberating liminal sense that we might get from the kind of traditional sources about shielings. Um, if these are kind of bothies of lovemaking, uh, then your, your, your Highland father is passing by fairly regularly to cut his peats. Um, And so this is, this is a kind of map of those shielding grounds then. So we've got, I would, I would say we've got two distinct kind of groups that represent two different activities going on here, even among the shielings. And so we can kind of try and create a kind of nuanced sense of how the landscape's actually being used um, in this kind of grazing. So we've got group one, which is up beside the peat banks and the very kind of higher reaches of the, 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 the glen, um, up one of the tributary burns. And this seems to be kind of smaller structures. They're about one metre uh, to one and a half metres across. Um, 
And they, they, they're kind of dotted along a burnscape. And these, these aren't spaces that you could spend any great deal of time in. Nobody's going to want to, to sit in a one and a half meter hut um, for any duration of time. You'll get quite the cramp. Um, and so presumably these are places that people are kind of coming up. They're taking shelter. They're perhaps storing certain products that are being gathered from this part of the landscape specifically. Um, but then they are traveling back down again. And so it's perhaps where kind of non-milking cattle um, and, and you know, your other livestock are being kept uh, separate. And they require less supervision, presumably, as well. They might also be being used by that kind of community of uh, peat cutters as well. Um, and the hill just opposite it um, is called, it, it translates as the, the hill of the healers. Um, and so potentially there's this idea that you've got kind of medicinal plants flourishing in these kind of upland boggy environments um, that can be used for various other purposes. Um, and so there's a kind of harvesting of these as well in this upland landscape. Um, and there's quite a lot of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a triple SI as a, as a, uh, for its alpine flora and fauna. Um, and particularly kind of clusters of things like uh, sundew, which had the medicinal property, supposedly, um, of you could use them to burn off freckles, um, if, if that was the kind of aesthetic of the day. The, the other main group then, I'll flick back to the map quickly, um, are these two kind of lower groups, so group two and three, I've called them. And these sit on the main kind of valley floor in this tribute to Glen, Glen Lachnamuya. Um, and they're kind of larger structures, um, they're probably your kind of classic shielings where you've got your milkmaids, and they're, they're, they've got their kind of prime herd of milking cows, um, and you're kind of supervising them, producing your, your various dairy products. Um, these kind of vary as well in size, though, and so we can kind of start to differentiate what might be going on here. Um, we've got some that are kind of four, approximately kind of four meters across, six meters across, and these seem to be your kind of average shielding. Some of them have a sort of stone foundation, but the vast majority of them are kind of turf-built structures. Um, but we also have some slightly different uh, features as well going on in this area, um, and I'll just pop onto them in a moment. Okay, so. This is, this is the largest feature that we've excavated thus far and that was recorded in the survey. Um, it's approximately nine meters across by about three meters uh, wide. Um, and it seems to be a kind of shielding hut, at least in its earliest phases. Um, there's some comparisons to this in the kind of Irish tradition. They call them bully huts. Um, they're sometimes called kind of Cayley huts in a Scottish context. And essentially, they're, they're these kind of larger shielding huts, they might have performed a kind of social function as the, the place where the party after the flitting happened, uh, the place where you know, you've got this kind of community of young people up in the hills. Um, presumably, they're, they're perhaps having access to a little bit of drink at certain points. Um, but generally, this is where there's music, there's people having uh, parties and such. And it's the kind of social hub of the shielding cluster, perhaps, especially um, and having spent even a summer up there. Uh, at various points. It's not always that nice. Um, you're, you're perhaps not wanting to be outside the whole thing. But there's also perhaps a kind of suggestion that these are, these are the, the, the huts constructed by kind of the wealthier landowners who are sending up a group of milkmaids, not of their own family, so kind of hired domestic servants. Um, and so they have a kind of slightly larger dwelling uh, set aside for them up there. So there's, there's these kind of competing ideas of what these might be for, but certainly there's something different from your kind of average and everyday shielding, the, the kind of smaller structures. This is one of those slightly smaller structures that we'd also excavated. Um, so this is a, a kind of rectangular turf-built shielding, about three or four meters across by about two meters. Um, and in the center, we've got this really nice central hearth with this uh, beautiful kind of circular slab on top of it, um, which we've interpreted as a smearing stone. So part of that kind of tradition that's been recorded of kind of smothering the fire out, uh, carrying the, the embers of the, the fire from your homestead up to the shielings and kind of lighting that home fire in the shieling and so bringing a part of the kind of protection of the home to the shieling. Um, and John Raven's written about that in the kind of context of the, the Irish shielings, uh, or of the, 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 sorry, the shieling's and the Uists, um, and Eugene Costello's written about them in an Irish context as well as part of this kind of tradition of bringing part of the township to the shieling. Um, but we've got this perhaps, I would say for the first time, archeologically evidence will hear within the kind of context of shieling's and there's a reconstruction drawing of what that might have looked like. Uh, and this is, so this is the, the, the third of the kind of features we've excavated so far. It's a fairly small shielding hut built of kind of these orthostatic stones levered up within a turf upper part um, and against a kind of bedrock boulder. Quite nicely, we managed to get a nice piece of kind of preserved timber post within that as well. Um, but this obviously represents a slightly different way of living and, and, and working within that upland landscape. Um, it's fairly small. It's only approximately kind of a meter by two meters. Um, so you could conceivably stay there for reasonable periods of time, um, but it's certainly not something that's being kind of occupied for an entire summer season in the trot, I would say, um, as well. So to, to, to think about the kind of what else is going on with it in this glen then and the other ways that this landscape's being used, uh, we have this settlement site that sits directly across the burn from that main shielding cluster that we'd kind of investigated. Um, and what seems to be happening here is quite unusual. It's a fairly small farmstead, but the buildings themselves are actually quite robust. 
Um, and so we have this traditional association of this site with the, the chiefs of the McDonald's of Glencoe. Um, so we know in the, the kind of earlier 1600s, uh, one of the, I think, in, yeah, 1610, uh, John Ogg, who's the ninth chief of the McDonald's of Glencoe, and his brother, uh, MacDonald of Achtrichten, um, are actually killed at their shillings by a party of Stuarts of Appen um, as part of this kind of ongoing dispute over who has rights to grazings on Rannoch. Um, in the, the kind of later tax records, it's noted that McKeon, who's the chief of MacDonald, who's killed in 1692, uh, he actually has a farm, supposedly, at Glenlach Namuya. Um, and there's, this, there's these quite kind of repeated accounts that call it the summer house of McKeon. Um, so there's an idea that the, actual, the chief of the McDonald's is actually traveling up into that kind of upland landscape. So away from his main farm and the kind of field of the galleys and his, and, and his kind of main dwelling down at uh, Carnock and Invercoe, he's instead moving up into the hills um, to this kind of structure here potentially. Um, and that begs the question then of why, why is this kind of the big figure in this glen? Why is the chief himself coming up into this landscape? And what is he doing there, if, he, if indeed he is there? Um, and so, sorry, let's see if that comes up. Yeah, so we have, here's some kind of basic survey that we've done so far of it. There's a quite complicated network of uh, enclosures um, in areas of rig and furrow. Um, but the main kind of township structure is, uh, this pointer works. Oh, yeah, uh, is this structure here, um, which may, it's quite, quite substantial in size. It's about 13, 14 meters uh, by four meters across. The walls are about one meter thick. Uh, stone. It's quite, so it's quite substantial, certainly in comparison to the structures excavated um, by Derek and the NTS down in uh, Achtrichten. And for thinking that this might be a kind of secondary farm, a secondary dwelling then, that suggests it's quite an important space. Um, it sits on the kind of rise of the hillside. It's not actually a particularly good farm position at all, really, um, from an agricultural point of view. But it sits on a rise in the hillside, viewing over the kind of main shielding clusters and the nicest area of grazings in the glen. And so thinking about the chief um, in this time period, and the McDonald's of Glencoe, quite famous for their cattle raiding, um, but if the cattle are your main signifier of your status, of your social status, of your economic status, of the kind of power you are as a person in this time period, then you probably want to keep quite a close watch on them, uh, especially during those summer months when they're kind of isolated and up out of the way, perhaps. And so that's what we might, this, we might think this structure represents. Um, and that's going to be the focus of a season of excavation um, this summer as well, in August, as part of the University of Glasgow Field School. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of identified as this kind of House of McKeon, uh, who is, yes, this, this kind of chief of the McDonald's. Um, and we see it kind of reproduced repeatedly. It's actually been excavated previously, uh, presumably by kind of, I think by the farmer and a bit of kind of antiquarian shifting uh, in the, the early uh, 20th century. Um, and we have this really nice illustration which matches exactly the kind of floor plan of the structure we have today, um, which is used by Seton Gordon and his uh, highways and byways of the Western Highlands. Um, and he identifies this having had a conversation with the local minister as this house of McKeon as well. So we're pretty sure we've got the right structure. Whether it is indeed a kind of chiefly upland dwelling would be quite interesting. And it might tie into kind of similar structures which have been kind of investigated. Gavin McGregor uh, had a look at one near Dalmali. Um, and, and there's potentially kind of other similar kind of elite upland sites, whether they be kind of hunting camps or, or kind of more permanent kind of farmstead site type structures um, in other upland contexts too. So moving on from then, we've got this quite intensely kind of busy seasonal landscape um, and during that kind of long uh, earlier part of the, the, the kind of early modern period, but coming into the kind of turn of, of what might be uh, the kind of early 19th century, this landscape changes quite drastically. Um, and so we see we've got the kind of, this idea that we've got the kind of, the busy pre-1690s landscape, I guess, um, which continues beyond. Um, and we've got kind of shielding grounds. We've got the, this potentially the chiefly summer uh, settlement, which whether that continues post-massacre or not, we don't really know, but it is primarily associated with McKeon. Uh, we've got the charcoal burning platforms and the peak cuttings. Um, by the, the period after that, we've kind of potentially lose that chiefly summer settlement. But in the 1790s, this landscape gets converted into a series of sheep farms. Um, and so we know that, that that farm settlement gets abandoned, it gets kind of reshifted to a position lower down the hill, and that gets kind of turned into an improvement farmstead with a sheep fold um, and some kind of traditional buildings. Um, and that most of those shielding grounds presumably then are also abandoned when that converts into a sheep farm. But the one thing that we do get appearing is that that larger shielding hut that, we'd ex that we've excavated, that I talked about earlier, it seems to survive actually, um, potentially we think, as a whiskey bothy. Um, and so it's, it's fairly close to the sheep farm actually, just sits on the other side of the barn, um, over a little rise, so it's quite uh, hidden actually from the main uh, track until you get to fairly close by. Um, and so that potentially uh, operates as a kind of hidden illicit still. Um, and I would say it's slightly more convincing than any of the ones that the NTS have excavated so far as well. Um, so inside the structure, what have we got? 
Well, we have this kind of cupboard feature into one corner. Um, you can see it in the, yeah, in the corner there. Um, there's this kind of stone built feature into the corner of the, sh the, the, the hut. Um, and within that, we had a kind of stone slab and then a hearth. Um, and in the hearth, we got a nice strip of kind of copper alloy. And I see my slides slightly uh, jambled itself. But yeah, there's a nice strip of kind of copper alloy. Obviously, this could be from a, a, a vessel, it could be uh, various other things, but it might also be a still worm. Um, and there are examples, um, I think, from is it Carrick, um, that of, a, of a kind of still worm that's now in the National Museum, um, which are fairly similar in style. We also got uh, underneath the kind of threshold stone, uh, a cache of kind of pistol shot, six pieces of pistol shot. Um, and there was also uh, some nice pieces of kind of broken onion uh, bulb glass vessel as well. Um, within the structure, there were three hearths, all of a kind of contemporary layer, and that's far too many to heat a structure of this size. Um, so something different is definitely going on, and that may represent those kind of three stages of the, the whiskey stilling process. The, the kind of drying of the grain, the production of the mash, uh, the wash, um, and then that, Oh, yeah. And then that uh, production as well of the, 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 dis the final kind of distilling. And that being kind of bricked up in a kind of feature in the corner is attested to in some of the oral history accounts as well. At the back of the structure, they'd also canalised a burn, so it ran right the way along the, the kind of end wall, providing a water supply to the structure. So potentially, we've got this kind of change in how the, this landscape's being used. And it's, it's sufficiently kind of emptied um, that people feel quite comfortable having their, their little illicit still somewhere up the glen. Um, so there's a kind of change in how this landscape's being viewed over this period. Um, but just to, to, to kind of conclude then, yeah, um, in, in contrast to those kind of big studies, the, the Ben Laws examples, um, and some of those that have been carried on uh, looking at kind of these estate centres, um, this is a, hopefully a, a kind of contrast to those by looking at a, far, a fairly small, a fairly powerless, really, group um, in the, the general history of this region, kind of almost at the whims of their, 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 their kind of larger and more powerful neighbours, the Stuarts of Appen and the Camels of Argyll and Glen Orkey. And yet, actually, the, the McDonald's of Glencoe are kind of negotiating their position within that upland landscape. Their, uh, their, their kind of, the presencing of the chief within that landscape perhaps speaks to his kind of extension of authority of, of kind of over the management of the cattle, the management of the grazings, the management of some of these other kind of resource uh, extractions as well within the upland landscape. Um, but also the, the, the very presence of the shielings there, the presence of people going up into the various kind of upper reaches of the glen maybe speaks to kind of a, a confirming of the boundaries of McDonald's grounds, um, especially where it kind of borders against the likes of Glen Creeran, which is obviously the, the kind of land of his rivals at various points. And so perhaps uh, through this kind of case study, we can see how these kind of estates that are forming in the early, kind of, uh, early to mid 1600s um, are being kind of controlled, are being kind of uh, negotiated over, I guess, within that upland landscape. Um, I'll pause just there, um, but just to, to, to thank you, uh, to say thank you to my supervisors, uh, to the various people who have kind of helped out in the field work, um, many of whom are, are here today, um, and to the various groups as well who have funded uh, this research, um, and in particular, Society of Antiquities of Scotland, SCARF, the National Trust for Scotland, uh, the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities, and various departments of the University of Glasgow as well. Um, so thank you very much for listening to that. Thank you.